Hello, everyone. Uh, well, I'm Davis. I'm here to speak about my research. First of, first of all, I want to thank to OGM for the opportunity to be part of, of this great community of researchers in progress. Secondly, I want to apologize for my English. As you may notice, uh, it's not my native language, so sorry. <laughs> Well, uh, what is the augmented reality? It's some kind of immersive technology um, that attempts to imitate a real experience through a digital or simulate replica. It seeks to be increasingly realistic that it to make it more difficult to differentiate the virtual from the real. In this sense, mixed reality, as knows, uh, immersive computing combines by virtual reality and augmented reality technology to make the user interface as close as possible to an interaction with the real world. Uh, this allows the user to immerse it in a virtual reality in total way that it is transmit the sensation of reality through the different senses. Immersive technology are based, are based on, on two pillars. One is the graphical interface, which offers the facility to feel a simulation environment. And the second is interaction with the content. So, but with, uh, there is, but what is that exactly? Uh, you can see the virtuality continuum. That is a concept uh, defined by Paul Milgram and Fumio Kuchino, more or less 20 years ago. Uh, it's a concept that serves to describe that there is a continuous scale that oscillates between um, the, a real environment and a virtual environment. For example, you can see uh, from the left, uh, there is a, a real uh, and cute corgi that it is in a real environment. But at the next uh, picture, you can see the, a Pikachu that Unfortunately, it's not real. For the third uh, peak, you can see the corgi in in uh, uh, the way to Palette Town, more or less. And the, the last picture is the virtual environment that is Pokemon in virtual reality. So you can see the way the, of the mix of reality. So the first uh, implementation of this technology was 60 years ago, more or less, by Morton Hailing. The, he made a sensorama multisensory experience, not just uh, for the visual sense, include the um, another sense too. So there is the implementation of augmented reality in a kind of, we have four levels. Um, at the level, uh, the first level uh, takes into account the user to hyperlink the user from the physical world to the virtual world. For example, a, a QR image, for, for example. And later we have the level one that is a marker-based augmented reality. That is a level, a map, usually black and white. It needs to help to, uh, you need a device to evoke that 3D element. At the level two, the augmented reality without markers. At this level, the 3D elements are evoked with the help of the GPS and the compass of the device 
in a real everyday environment. It's also called GPS compass based augmented reality. And the last level is, uh, is the augmented vision. This achieved with the help of the lightweight equipment in the form of glasses, for example, the, this is the most immersive that could be achieved with this technology. An example of this was the Google Glasses project, but uh, is being discontinued. But another enterprise as Oppo, they have another kind of glasses. But what is augmented reality in education? <clears throat> Time for application in education, mainly in biology, biology, engineering, and architecture, more or less. But really, the, the limit is the imagination. There are studies that deal with the incorporation of augmented reality in history and no formal concept, such as museums, for example. The, the level, um, the, first, the principal level of this implementation is the higher education. Uh, augmented reality allows the user to see a real world with virtual objects superimposed or composed with a real uh, world. This technology mixes real elements with the virtual ones to create a new community scenario. Combining real and virtual objects in a real environment and in real and virtual objects with each other and execute them interactively and into execute and interactive and in a real time. As you can see at this image. But we are talking about the contribu contributions of augmented reality in education. First, removal of certain information from the user's field of perception and interaction. Second, increasing the information available to the user in a given context. Third, interaction with the object for, for the observation from different perspective of and um, point of view. Four, enrichment of notes and printed material for students. Four, five, production of objects by the, uh, for the students, prosumers of objects in augmented reality. And the sixth is creation of artificial scenarios Say for training. So this is uh, the state of art. Uh, I made a, a database basis from Web of Science Scopus. I found uh, 200 articles more or less, um, but there are 70 good art articles for this study. <clears throat> there was a greater number of publications in web, uh, web science with a trend, uh, more or less 40 percent. Mm, the most uh, studies, studies are in, um, empirical representing more or less uh, 70 percent and just 30 percent for theoretical studies. The contrast in, in, in the five in figure three shows the preference of research to conduct empirical studies, especially with a quantitative methodology. The, this kind of study are certain in Spain. We found 22 articles in this country, just in this country. So uh, the implementation of this technology is being promoted through research and support groups. Uh, for example, Rafodium is, is a name from a group 
or if it, uh, for exactly for the Ministry of Economy of a Spanish government. So thanks for the fact that most of the researches are attached to universities, this allow for music studies to be conducted in this population. We found this, um, this uh, interesting biometric network made from the reference for the artic articles analyzed. As you can see, cinco main clusters can be grouped by uh, that they are oriented towards that there are uh, sensorial learning, innovation trends, mobile learning, teaching learning, medical application, and innovation entrepreneurship. So I, I saw these clusters. Uh, I, I try to engage this technology for the education through the through this technology. So I made um, this um, uh, web called uh, Edward. Uh, this is a, a web page that you can find different kinds of tools for uh, apps, applications, articles, uh, uh, reviews, etc. This is and this is an example from Cocam B incorporate this technology for education and it's free. The principal characteristic is, is free. For example, there is my so oh, I'm here, but there is a little cube that maybe you can see now a brain. So I hope the different kind of t-shirts can show this technology from their students um, free. <laughs> this is free, actually. You, you can need a, a smartphone and you can show different parts of the body or another kind of, of, of matter that you can do. Max uh, are to uh, a new, a good technology too. So there is all for me. All right, um, so I'm so happy to be here to talk a little bit about my research, uh, exploring the perceptions of scale among open educators. Uh, so I'm talking to you today from my home in New Westminster, BC, Canada, which is on the unceded territory of the Kakite Nation. Um, I am a white settler, and before living here, I lived in the Inuvik, so I, right now I'm in this little red dot down here. Well, if I do this, you can see it. I don't know. Anyway, the little red one down here, New Westminster. Uh, before that, I lived in Inuvik in the Northwest Territories, the red dot very close to the top of the screen. Uh, and uh, my kids are in Ivalwit. And my oldest daughter returned uh, last year to work in Inuvik. And on Saturday, me and my youngest two, these are my youngest two kids right here, returned from a visit from uh, Inuvik. So this is them at the airport. So while we were there, we spent a few days out at the family cabin on the land. And one of the very first things that you need to do when you go out on the land is to get water. Unlike in town where the water comes from the tap, to get water at the camp, we need to chisel a hole. So this is um, their auntie and this is my oldest daughter. And as you can see, they've, uh, they've started work with their red chisel. Uh, and then we chiseled some more. 
And then we chiseled some more. Uh, and it took six of us about two hours of chiseling. And eventually, finally, after about four feet of ice, we hit water. Uh, so then we carried the water back to the cabin, which was about 500 meters away. And every time we wanted water, we went back. We chiseled any ice off the top that had formed in the time since we left uh, and scooped out our water and carried it home. So I'm sure you're wondering what this story has to do with open education in my research. To me, this really is a story about technology and scale. The chisels and buckets are the technology that we use to get small amounts of water that we needed to our cabin. The water was free, but it involved a whole lot of work to retrieve it. When we're in town, pumping stations, pipes, fixtures, and different types of technology are used to drop and distribute much more water from the same river to many houses with far more speed and efficiency than we're doing it with our buckets. Although both the approaches to getting water work. Um, our relationship with that water was completely different when we were on the land. Um, clearly, we thought more about our water uh, when we use this process versus turning on our tap. And even the temperature of the water is different. The water uh, coming out of that hole is uh, as close to freezing as you can get with liquid water. So to me, open education is a little bit similar. Open education involves the use of a variety of processes and tools to support learning and the sharing of knowledge that can also be um, applied at a variety of scales. And in my research, what I was really trying to understand was how when we change the scale that we're working at within the field of open education, how that changes the experience, um, and the nature of what it means to learn for, for everyone involved. So how did I actually do that? So I used a, a research methods package called situational analysis. And situational analysis is really interested in relationships and in change. Um, and it's, it's a, a a post-structural methodology that's really looking at getting beyond the knowing subject, taking into account non-humans and highlighting that relationality. And situational analysis uses three different map, map, map making techniques to do this. So the first map on the left is a situational map. The map in the middle is a social worlds arena map, and the map on the uh, right is a positional map. So in the first type of map, relational maps are used to identify relationships between ideas, concepts, and actors. And for my research, I engaged six open educators in a collaborative mapping activity, so they used Google I don't know what it was, Google Draw maybe, um, to, to draw those little lines between each of those items. And then as they drew those lines, they also uh, annotated. So they, they told me what they were thinking about as they were doing that. And then I later held focus groups in which we discussed the map in more detail. The map that they generated was really interesting as it's the field through the eyes of open educators. They talked about their desires to enable access by moving beyond courses, reaching wider audiences and enabling social justice. They talked about how overwork was a significant challenge. At the same time, the purpose of this activity was really to talk about scale within open education. Um, and as you can see, I've put black squares around them. The scale related words, big and small, ended up being pretty um, peripheral in the map. And so it became really clear that even in my research, <laughs> they knew what they were there to talk about. Even within this research, my participants were not really comfortable talking about the topic of scale. And, and the question was really why. 
So the next map ma making technique within situational analysis is a social worlds arena map. So to build this map, I used the information gathered by my research participants as a starting point to identify all of the social worlds or groups um, who may have an interest in open education. And this led me to draw a dramatically different map of open education. Although we tend to focus on students, instructors, and open educators when we think about the field of open education, this mapping technique highlighted the role of publishers, ed tech, technology companies, philanthropic foundations, and governments, and the roles that they're playing within that gray circle there. That's the arena of open education. And you can see all of these all of these huge um, social worlds um, are, you know, they're involved in other things as well. They do things outside of open education, but they also all, they're um, invested and overlapping within the field of open education. Doing additional research, I found that unlike my open educators, uh, these immensely powerful social worlds tend to be absolutely obsessed with scale and explicitly, explicitly seek to achieve the most massive of scale by any means possible. So by the time I got to this point in my research, I really had two very different maps of open education. One built by open educators talking about their motivations and the other really looking at these really huge um, organizations uh, explicitly seeking to achieve scale. So then the question was, how, how, how do these relate to one another? And to be honest, for quite a while, I didn't have an answer. So looking for answers and staying true to my methodology, I uh, turned to the third type of mapping, positional mapping, and I created two maps. And one is a, a, a positional map based on a production model of scale. And the second is a positional map based on a growth model of scale. Positional maps are intended to analyze topics of controversy and to help make silences speak. And that was really good news for me, seeing as I had a topic that my research participants were reluctant to discuss. So what I did was map all of the positions, both taken and not taken as they related to scale. Um, on these two positional maps. So in the first map, I identified all of the positions taken aligned with a production model of scale. This model centers on efficiently achieving scale through standardization and the division of labor. It is the approach to scale most commonly seen in our corporations, schools, uh, governments, and underlying are the technological tools that we're using um, throughout open education. Uh, the other model of scale, a growth model of scale, is something that although none of my research participants described clearly or were able to name uh, through the earlier relational map and through this mapping activity, I really began to see an emerging um, tacit understanding, right? Something that that couldn't really be articulated or that they struggled to articulate, understanding of what uh, this model of scale really means. And within the growth model of scale, things are unpredictable, they're nonlinear and they're inefficient. And we don't, we see this, you'll see this model in your garden, right? This is how your plants grow. <laughs> you never know what you're gonna get in, until you know, your plants decide for you. Okay, so based on my research, I identified nine findings grouped into three categories. Uh, findings related to situational research theory and methods, open education's big intentions, and the importance of scale-related intentionality within open education. So in terms of um, the actual theory and methods themselves, uh, so far as I can tell, this is the first time situational analysis has been applied certainly to open education um, and probably educational technology as well. Um, and so 
what I found is that I, you know, this ability to map both the big and the small, I think is really, uh, really has um, potential value within the field of open education. Um, and what I found is that, you know, it was really important for me to trust those mapping processes, uh, even when I didn't know where I was going or, or couldn't see the connections myself and really follow through. And by doing that, um, I was able to develop a really robust view of open education that I didn't expect to find. Uh, my second finding was really related to that collaborative mapping activity. Uh, which really for me was a way of drawing some of our open approaches to research, open research, open collaboration into the methodology of situational analysis. And I really see an opportunity there for um, more collaborative approaches to situational analysis that have the capacity to, to push the methodology even further around the post-structural bend or turn. And the third thing is, whoops, what did I do? Let's see, I always do something. Um, and the third thing was that um, I found that using this approach really enabled me to avoid confirmatory research as it really forced me to challenge both my own assumptions and the assumptions and biases of my research participants. So open education's big intentions. So what I found here is that there's been, I mean, there's nothing new about the co-opting of open education and open education language by big corporations. Um, it's been, you know, it's been going on since, so far as I can tell, the beginning of the use of the term open education. I don't know, <laughs> very, very long time ago. Um, and it's some, but it's something that I think we really need to um, think more about and and think about what our role as open educators is in this bigger um, ecosystem. Uh, something called the games of scientific language, which is, to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a concept by Leotard, but it's the more money you put at something, the more money you put behind something, the more likely your ideas are going to be found to be right. Um, and as we have these huge corporations and foundations funding research, what is the impact for that on our open education research? And the third is really overwork among open educators because there's this desire to have a big impact. It really, it, it comes at a cost and it often comes at a cost um, that comes in the form of overwork and unpaid work. And you know, finally, scale related intentionality. So what I really took away from this is that there are these different models of scale, but because we're so reluctant to talk about scale, we, we don't talk about some very nuanced differences and, and some very nuanced differences, points and decision points where we can decide to go one way or another way. We're not clear about what we wanna be. And as a, re as a result, there's a risk of us falling into these very prescriptive patterns, um, which, which is what we're trying to avoid and yet what we continue to fall into over and over again. Uh, the second is that if, we're, if we really are going to adopt a growth approach, that it means accepting unpredictability and uncertainty. And I really question if that's, you know, it's scary and I, 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 you know, we need to really think about that. And the third is to talk about these things in order to avoid uh, or minimize educational disasters. Um, you know, just like the water, right? The water that I showed in the picture, um, there was gonna be huge oil and gas projects in this area that put this water source at risk. And the Innovaluate decided not to proceed with those because the, the, that water, that ability to chisel a hole and drink the water out of it, for them was worth uh, the risk of not doing other things. And I think we really need to think about education and, and learning in that same way. What, what should we not do in order to, to minimize those educational disasters? Uh, so in conclusion, our tools and processes define us, define our relationships, define what it means to know things. Um, if we're seeking big experiences, we'll seek efficiencies. If we were seeking to get water to thousands of people, I promise you I'm not carrying it to them in those buckets. Um, and 
it's important for us to be clear about what we're seeking to achieve in terms of scale. Uh, you know, the value of that activity, the value of us going out on the land and using a little red chisel to get water is, the, you know, they're, they're, it, it's important. And um, we lose that, you know, even if we brought in an electric otter, we auger, we lose that part of that experience. And I think it's really important that we think carefully and critically about what, it's, what we're trying to achieve with open education and then ensure that the size and the scale and the scope of the tools that we're using and the processes that we're using align with the outcomes that we're seeking to achieve. I'm a student and I'm based at the University of West of Scotland, which is in Paisley. Um, and until I'd seen Tanya's presentation, I was thinking, gosh, I'm quite a remote student because I live in the northwest of Scotland. And I've certainly had times in the winter where I've gone to get frozen water, but I don't live as remotely as Tanya does. So um, I feel slightly less remote than I did before. But um, certainly from my positionality as a researcher, I've benefited hugely from open education um, resources, access, and so on, and, and that's really got me where I am today because I'm uh, a mature PhD student. I'm sort of in my mid forties and um, started out life in farming and ended up um, teaching agriculture and um, did a master's of education at the University of Highlands and Islands, where I first sort of became immersed in the world of education through Professor Frank Rennie, who I'm sure some of you all know. And that made me quite passionate about it. But my PhD focus isn't on open education, but naturally, whether it's happened because um, I'm interested in it or whether I've had some findings, um, some of it links to open education. So I hope to share that with you today. Um, and really, my topic looks at the, the pub public engagement in higher education and, and in, in the way that researchers are sort of um, obliged. As, as a sort of as researchers to ensure that there is public education, I looked at sort of some sort of formal frameworks and informal frameworks and started my um, investigations on this topic. So I looked at a few papers around this topic, and one key one that came up for you was written by Jim McKinley and colleagues at UCL, and he looked at the ways that teaching and research link with various different aspects of academic life. Um, teaching and research is described in his paper as a nexus, a bridge between the two functions. And that's not really a new idea. It was first sort of introduced by Willem von Humboldt in 1810, when he um, set out a treatise for education when he established the University of Berlin at that time. Um, so I was particularly interested in public engagement and looking at his um, assessment, it sort of shows clear links between the two functions, but there wasn't really much information on it and particularly not in Scotland. Um, and I also another place I had a look at was the um, review of the REF, which is a UK, um, essentially a league table, I suppose you could call it in one, one sense, um, research excellence framework, which kind of assesses case studies submitted by academics at various universities. And if you notice here in panel B, which includes various STEM disciplines from ranging from aeronautics to physics and chemistry, they appeared to um, submit very few case studies that mentioned public engagement. So I thought that's another area of interest that didn't have much knowledge. Um, and finally, the third area where I found the few research gaps is really about how this works with undergraduates. And I read quite a lot of papers by Mick Healy and this one in particular, um, looking at the way that you can sort of co-create with students as partners and and trying to find out if there are ways that public engagement can be integrated into that. So finally, this brought me to my research questions, which wanted to look at the experience of Scottish academics and, and how they integrate these three elements of their practice. So my sort of lens of research was based upon um, this concept, which is quite nicely summed up in the paper by Stevenson and MacArthur that I reference here. Um, so as I said, I went out to Scottish lecturers um, at any, any university based in Scotland, and I did a couple of interviews um, 
through 2021, 22. Obviously, it's during the pandemic. I kind of had thought in an ideal world, I wanted to be a case study, um, but that wasn't really going to happen when everything was locked down. So I had to sort of uh, rethink my lines of inquiry and it actually worked quite well. I did a sort of interpretive phenological analysis and very um, also used autoethnography alongside that as my methodology. So then I did a bit of number crunching and um, reading some transcripts, marking them up, putting them through en vivo and uh, writing lots of notes and journals. And of the 10 people that I did interview, nine agreed to sort of carry on with their um, interviews being recorded. Um, and I found that most people seem to be located between the research teaching nexus. Very few um, in the middle, of, with the exception of two who are early career researchers. So I saw that the people who are sort of in their earlier stage of their career have that as more of a culture change that we should have those three elements working together. Um, and then when I sort of did the final analysis, which I've written up my findings, I haven't, I'm sort of in the process of writing up my discussion really. And that's why I'm coming to you guys today as well to really talk about this and find out any opinions you might have that relate to one area of findings which relate to open educational practices. Um, but there was there was quite a lot of sort of connections between all these aspects, but things that were sort of, um, I guess, concerning, if you look at the green section, academic identity, the, the links between public engagement and research, research is often funded um, through sort of points or different um, definitions of impact. So if you can show impact, you might get higher levels of funding. And for some of the people I spoke to, they enjoyed engaging with the public, but when it came down to sort of monetizing it or uh, making it a performance related issue, that they, they felt that took away from their identity slightly. So looking at my themes, the places where I found that open education came to the forefront were, I've put the WE logo from the GOGM network there, um, in these particular areas. So one example, third spaces online um, people would use or research using hashtags for example and collect data in that way and it could be through blogs or interactive social media twitter facebook etc um, another area along data gathering was communities of practice so computer scientists for example they would use open educational practices by encouraging students to get into open source coding and then share aspects of code, contribute to code. And that wasn't really measured as, as an impact. Um, so for example, when I look back at the impact case studies, computer science showed quite a low level of public impact or engagement. But in fact, when I spoke to computer scientists, I found that they probably were doing that, but just didn't either realize it as such or didn't know how to measure it. And that's still a question really I have, you know, and I did ask a few scientists, well, if you're using these kind of open coding areas and have a community of practice, how do you actually then measure this or how do you record this? Um, for students, um, undergraduates, particularly during the times of the pandemic, open, edu open education resources were particularly useful, um, not only for co-creation, um, for things like computer programming, but also I found when I spoke to chemists, they'd use it for liquid chromatography. There's an open education resource lab that um, can run these tests. And that was quite useful as well in the sense that um, they could take this back and use it within their own lab and then make adjustments and then update it. So again, that shows the sort of resilience of open educational resources that they can constantly evolve and it's not like you know a textbook or a computer program where you have to have a new release and maybe wait a few years and pay a lot of money for it so it helped help to enable a lot of resilience during the period of the pandemic um certainly for the political issues and association with education the impact agenda as it's called i mean this is the thing i refer to the sort of the way that um research is kind of measured in the league table or an assessment research um, excellence framework assessment. How do you actually monitor, measure, and evaluate open educational resources, open educational practices, and, and kind of make sure that that has a really prominent um, space within that? 
Um, from the people I spoke to, they weren't really sure how that could happen. So I'd be really interested to hear from you guys what your thoughts are. Um, also, another one looking down back to, again to the pandemic, um, a term pivot pedagogy came about. And that really referred to the pivot that educators had to make from having face-to-face -face activity to running online. And certainly the educators I spoke to in Scotland who had been at distributed campuses, you know, a bit like I described somewhere like the University of Highlands and Ireland, they found that pivot during the time of the pandemic exceptionally easy because they'd already been used to that way of integrating open educational practices into their work. So it really shows it's quite a resilient um, way to uh, run your teaching and learning. So that was quite encouraging. So looking forward, I'm obviously getting to the point where I'm writing my discussion. Um, and I've referred to some of the books and some of you are in the audience today who um, I, I read through um, Martin Weller's book, which was a fundamental part of my master's um, modules on this. Sort of thinking about the legal definitions of open education, it's, it was really useful for me as an educator to know about things like Creative Commons licenses and so on. Not everyone I spoke to actually really had a knowledge of that. So it kind of underlined that even though in Scotland we're quite far ahead in this, um, we probably still need to kind of really um, cement this into the way that people use it in their day to day practice. But I think the pandemic's been a real catalyst for this and it has opened the eyes of people, not just in distributed campuses, campuses but all over um, the OERs, OEPs are, are great ways to um, run your curriculum. Um, if you'd like to read about anything I'm doing, I'm on Twitter and I've got a website there. And I'd be interested to hear what you guys think about some of the things that I've raised today. Thanks very much. So the way it's going to work now is that, unfortunately, we haven't been able to have ready the uh, live translation. So uh, Beep has uh, her presentation in uh, uh, in English uh, and she will be presenting in Spanish. And after yeah. certain points, she will be yeah. uh, stopping so I can I can try to summarize some of the key points. So hopefully it will work. Uh, uh, so uh, Bibi, uh, cuando quieras. Okay. Gracias, Paco. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Eh, bueno, pues presentaré en español. Me excuso por eh, mi pésimo inglés. Entonces vamos en español con la ayuda de Paco. Eh, vamos, vamos a ver si nos, nos hacemos entender de la mejor forma. Bueno, eh, a continuación voy a presentar los avances de mi tesis de investigación doctoral, eh, que es el microaprendizaje. Eh, el microlearning y la teoría cognitiva del aprendizaje multimedia en el desarrollo de competencias digitales de docentes universitarios. Esta es una investigación que está siendo dirigida por la doctora Ana García de la Universidad de Salamanca en el marco del doctorado en formación en la asociada del conocimiento. Bueno, a lo largo de esta presentación vamos a hacer un breve recorrido por cuál es nuestro objetivo de investigación, nuestra metodología y algunos avances que se han desarrollado en torno al estudio. Iniciaremos por nuestro objetivo. Bien, tenemos dos objetivos centrales en la investigación. Uno es analizar la función de los principios del aprendizaje multimedia en el diseño de una estrategia de microlearning para el desarrollo de competencias digitales docentes. Y también tenemos la, la intención de proponer y validar una estrategia de diseño de microlearning basada en la aplicación de los principios del aprendizaje multimedia para el desarrollo de competencias docentes en la Universidad de La Salle. Tenemos esos dos objetivos, analizar la función de estos principios y también validar una estrategia de formación que esté orientada por los mismos. De manera específica, vamos a reconocer los campos de, de, de aplicación del microlearning como una estrategia de formación y de la teoría cognitiva del aprendizaje multimedia en los últimos años. 
vamos a identificar el nivel de competencia digital de los docentes de la Universidad de La Salle desde el referente DICOM-EDU. Vamos a diseñar una estrategia de microlearning basada en los principios del aprendizaje multimedia orientada a fortalecer las competencias digitales con menor desarrollo en los docentes lasallistas. Posteriormente vamos a implementar el proceso de formación de competencias digitales docentes a partir de una estrategia de microlearning en la universidad y cerraremos con una evaluación de la efectividad del proceso de formación en competencias digitales a partir de la estrategia de microlearning desarrollada. Los orientadores conceptuales de la investigación o la fundamentación conceptual del estudio está orientada a partir de tres categorías de análisis. Una es eh, la categoría competencia digital, estudiaremos sus referentes y la forma de medir este tipo de competencia. El microlearning, estudiaremos su aporte específico a la formación eh, docente. Y por último, la teoría cognitiva del aprendizaje multimedia, estudiaremos sus principios y cómo estos pueden ser aplicados en una estrategia de formación docente. En cuanto a la categoría conceptual competencia digital, se ha identificado que eh, esta competencia, pues en primer lugar, es considerada un requisito profesional de los docentes a nivel mundial. Y por ende, y por ende cuenta con diferentes referentes o marcos a nivel mundial. Su diagnóstico da cuenta de necesidades específicas que requieren a su vez una formación a la medida. Y allí el que pues no consideremos que una formación eh, igual para todos los docentes pueda funcionar, el aporte pues que podría tener el microaprendizaje. La segunda categoría es el microlearning. En cuanto a esta categoría, se ha identificado que es una valiosa estrategia de formación docente debido a su capacidad para segmentar el contenido en pequeños bloques, permitir la autogestión, eso quiere decir el desarrollo de la formación por parte del usuario a su propio ritmo, y la agilidad en cuanto al diseño y la actualización que permite este tipo de formación. La siguiente categoría es la teoría cognitiva del aprendizaje multimedia. La hemos estudiado, hemos estudiado sus aportes debido a que analiza cómo aprendemos desde el estudio de la arquitectura cognitiva humana. Esto es estudiar cómo aprendemos desde eh, el, 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 la estructura de una memoria sensorial, una memoria de trabajo, una memoria de largo plazo y cómo esto incide o, o de qué forma el material multimedia o la combinación de formatos multimedia permite el aprendizaje a partir de la comprensión de este mecanismo de aprendizaje, de esta forma en que aprendemos. Eh, en este mismo sentido, esta teoría nos habla de unos principios que nos permiten mejorar el diseño de los ambientes y los recursos educativos digitales que diseñamos y su aplicación, la aplicación de estos principios, nos van a permitir o, o van a facilitar el aprendizaje. De allí el que pretendamos hacer esta combinación de estos tres elementos conceptuales en la construcción de una estrategia de formación. No sé, Paco, si de pronto hasta allí eh, hará falta un redondear alguna idea en inglés. Ok. Uh, yes, let's give it a try. So, ok. So first of all, just to contextualize that uh, uh, even if you are based in, a, in a, uh, well, you are studying your PhD at the University of Salamanca in Spain, uh, and you are based in Colombia, and you're focusing your study on on the University La Salle uh, there. Uh, so your thesis about uh, 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 trying to understand the advances of micro learning in developing digital competencies for university teachers with two main objectives. Uh, if I captured them correctly, you want to analyze the role of uh, the principles of multimedia learning in the design of a micro learning strategy uh, with the objective to develop digital teaching competencies. 
As well, we are proposing and validating microlearning design strategy based on the application of the principles of multimedia learning for the development of digital teaching competencies at, uh, at La Salle University. Uh, trying to address several aspects, so to recognize the fields of application of micro credentials, oh, sorry, micro, <laughs> my my brain, micro learning as a training strategy uh, and of the cognitive theory of uh, multimedia learning in recent years, as well trying to identify the level of those competencies uh, of teachers at uh, at uh, La Salle University, and for that you are going to use the the uh, Comp Edu framework, as well. Uh, trying to design microlearning strategy based on the principles of multimedia learning and trying to uh, keep on uh, and strengthen digital competencies that are less developed uh, for the teachers in that university, as well uh, trying to implement uh, training processes uh, in digital teachers' competencies based uh, on microlearning strategy and evaluate those uh, training processes. Um, so three main areas that you are researching, so the digital competencies of teachers, micro learning, and you're using the cognitive theory. I think that basically captures more or less what you try to say. It's kind of difficult to follow everything. <laughs> and that's why people study a bachelor degree on translation. Okay. Uh Bibi, puedes continuar. Okay, gracias, Paco. Bueno, vamos a ver el cómo es nuestra metodología, la metodología que hemos adoptado en el estudio. Eh, Esta metodología se concentra en eh, dos marcos metodológicos. Uno es la investigación basada en el diseño y en la investigación evaluativa. Vamos a ver que estos elementos se conjugan a lo largo de toda la metodología que les vamos a presentar. La primera fase de nuestra metodología es una fase de análisis donde vamos a realizar un diagnóstico de competencias y también una evaluación de contexto a partir de una serie de revisiones sistemáticas. Posteriormente, vamos a una fase de desarrollo donde diseñaremos el mapa de esa estrategia que vamos a implementar y realizaremos a su vez una evaluación de entrada, es decir, vamos a evaluar ese plano, esa estrategia que queremos eh, formular. Luego, pasaremos a una fase de diseño donde crearemos el prototipo de la estrategia de formación y vamos entonces a evaluar el proceso de diseño. Notarán que cada fase tiene su propio proceso, su, su componente tanto de diseño como de evaluación. Luego tendremos una fase de implementación donde a partir de un muestreo eh, y la aplicación de un protocolo ético, pues entraremos a identificar a quiénes aplicar la estrategia, realizaremos un pretest y un postest, una formación piloto y realizaremos la evaluación del aprendizaje. La última fase es la fase de evaluación, donde eh, evaluaremos o miraremos hacia atrás toda la estrategia, hacemos una retrospección, eh, analizaremos el nivel de transferencia que tienen los profesores de la estrategia, es decir, hasta qué punto aplican lo visto en, le, en la estrategia de formación. Y por último, realizaremos lo que llama en la, la metodología de investigación basada en el diseño, una evaluación de todo el producto, eh, dadas pues toda la, el cumplimiento de todas las fases de la metodología. No sé, Paco, si de pronto algún elemento aquí sea necesario aclarar. I think this one was quite self-describing. I think it's quite uh, clear the different five steps. Yo creo que está bastante claro. Ok, perfecto, gracias. Bueno, entonces ahora hablaremos de qué hemos avanzado. Este es un poco el, el objetivo central de, de la presentación, es mostrarles un poco los avances que se han desarrollado a lo largo de la investigación. Entonces vamos a ir eh, siguiendo también nuestra, nuestro marco metodológico y vamos a ver que el primer elemento que hemos visto o el primer elemento que, que trabajamos es el diagnóstico de competencias. Frente a este tema del diagnóstico de competencias, eh, en la universidad pues recopilamos una serie de datos de un diagnóstico de autopercepción de competencias aplicado en 2021 a los docentes de la Universidad de La Salle eh, este diagnóstico nos arrojó información muy importante, nos indica que los profesores pues, en el área de, de competencia específica sobre evaluación y retroalimentación es donde presentan un menor desempeño, una menor autopercepción eh, de su competencia en un nivel de progresión muy alto. Aquí en pantalla ustedes pueden ver una tablita que nos muestra los resultados de las tres competencias que se evalúan en esta área y en rojo se puede identificar 
eh, lo, la autopercepción que tienen los profesores sobre sus niveles de competencia en estas áreas y notarán pues, que todas tienden a ser menores. A, 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 el resultado pues, tiende a ser menor y por eso el área que se selecciona en nuestro estudio es el área de evaluación y retroalimentación. O sea, aquí en, ese, en esa área específica delimitamos la investigación. No sé, Paco, si de pronto sobre este puntico requ requieras alguna traducción. Sí. Ok, yeah. Uh, so, basically, what we can see here and, and what yeah, you have been trying to, to follow is the, the key areas of self-evaluation from uh, the teachers in La Salle. So, uh, considering those three, the ICT for development of formative and summative evaluations, ICT for student data analysis, and ICT to provide effective feedback. So, in the, the, the key aspect that you have realized is more important and you are focusing your research on is the last one. So, to provide effective feedback. Vale. Gracias, Paco. Bueno, el siguiente paso en nuestra metodología es la evaluación de contexto. Y para realizar esto, entonces desarrollamos tres eh, revisiones sistemáticas sobre cada categoría de análisis. Estas revisiones, dos de ellas ya se encuentran publicadas. Al final podrán ver la, las, los artículos donde se encuentran eh, publicadas las fuentes para que las podamos consultar. Eh, se desarrollan tres revisiones para tener pues toda una, una, una visión muy clara sobre el estado de la investigación en el área. Sobre competencia digital en particular, se identificó que el referente con mayor aceptación es el DICOM EDU, siendo España un país pionero en investigación sobre esta área. El área común con menor desarrollo que se identificó en estas investigaciones que revisamos es precisamente la evaluación y retroalimentación y las estrategias de formación eh, tienden eh, que, que han, pues, se, se han identificado para el desarrollo de la competencia digital, tienden a ser estrategias ágiles y son como las mejor aceptadas en el gremio docente. También realizamos una eh, revisión sistemática sobre la categoría microlearning, Allí se identifica que el microlearning tiene un mayor impacto en el contexto empresarial, en el área de ingeniería, en la formación en educación y en el área de la salud. Eh, tenemos también que las estrategias, tenemos también que las estrategias que se utilizan para el diseño de, las de, de, de la microformación está enriquecida por microvideos, por códigos QR, por simuladores, por el uso de redes sociales por la participación de, de pronto en cursos MOOC y por estrategias de aprendizaje móvil. También se identifica que la población a la que le resulta ideal el uso de estrategias de microformación es la población adulta, en especial porque ayuda a evitar la curva de olvido, que es un elemento que pasa mucho en, en, en población adulta cuando pues, se exponen a procesos de formación muy largos. Entonces el microlearning resulta muy pertinente para población mayor. Y por último, el diseño, en cuanto a las estrategias de diseño, lo ideal es que eh, toda estrategia de formas de microlearning sea simple, corta y muy precisa. Esa es una de las características que tiene esta, esta formación. En cuanto a eh, la teoría cognitiva del aprendizaje multimedia, se identificó que las áreas en las que mayor aplicación se está haciendo de esta teoría es el área de idiomas, también de la medicina, de ingeniería y la geografía. Eh, los principios que más se están estudiando, que más se están investigando de esta teoría son los principios multimedia, de redundancia y de modalidad. Y los objetivos de las investigaciones en torno a esta teoría eh, giran en torno a cómo reducir la carga cognitiva, cómo mejorar la comunicación efectiva, cómo comparar estrategias y además sobre cómo utilizar diferentes test para identificar la carga cognitiva, el procesamiento cognitivo, la memoria de trabajo, la curva del olvido, la motivación. Eh, bueno, no sé si es hasta este punto, Paco, alguna breve traducción. No, creo que ha estado claro. I think it was quite clear. Súper, gracias. Bueno, eh, la, seguimos avanzando entonces en nuestra metodología y ya in, entramos a la fase de desarrollo y vamos a hablar un poco del mapa de la estrategia. A partir de estas revisiones que realizamos, eh, logramos construir una, un mapa de una estrategia de formación en microlearning. Este mapa tiene eh, tres componentes esenciales o se construyó a partir de tres elementos. 
El primero es que eh, al ya tener seleccionada un área que era el área del feedback, de la retroalimentación, pues necesitamos documentarnos, documentarnos sobre este componente, sobre qué es la retroalimentación, Ahí identificamos algunos autores, expertos, incluso eh, contactamos pues algunos expertos en el área para validar pues nuestra estrategia. También en esta fase jerarquizamos, es decir, establecimos unos niveles de habilidad del A2 al C2 para eh, organizar esa estrategia de formación a partir de unas habilidades que van en esta escala de progresión, eh, la cual pues se corresponde también a la escala que maneja el referente Bitcoin Edu. Y por último, pues para que esta estrategia funcione y para ser eh, consecuentes con nuestra metodología de investigación, esta propuesta temática pues se somete a una validación por expertos también. La, el mapa de la estrategia entonces queda más o menos organizado bajo el esquema que ven en pantalla. Primero, pues el, el desarrollo de, de competencias digitales bajo, bajo el marco DICOM EDU, específicamente en el área de evaluación y retroalimentación. Seleccionamos el ítem C3, que es feedback, o sea, la retroalimentación específicamente, la habilidad del profesor para retroalimentar. Y la estrategia la organizamos en los eh, niveles de progresión del DICOM, como vemos aquí en la base, donde en el nivel A2 pues el profesor aprenderá unos elementos muy instrumentales sobre herramientas digitales que le aportan a, a mejorar su retroalimentación y así sucesivamente irá progresando hasta en un nivel B1 proporcionar una retroalimentación más efectiva, en un nivel B2 utilizar analíticas, métricas para enriquecer su retroalimentación, en un nivel C1 cómo personalizar su feedback y en un nivel C2 cómo utilizar nuevos sistemas para seguir enriqueciendo sus habilidades en el campo de la retroalimentación del aprendizaje. Aquí en pantalla pueden ver un poco la, ya cada nivel, el nivel A2, eh, con su respectivo bloque de microcursos, la propuesta temática de microcursos. El primer bloque de cómo seleccionar herramientas tecnológicas para brindar retroalimentación del aprendizaje con los respectivos microcursos que se van a diseñar, que es qué es retroalimentar, qué herramientas me pueden ayudar a retroalimentar, retroalimentar desde rúbricas y listas de cotejo, un bloque 2, que es el B1, eh, que nos orienta sobre cómo retroalimentar en un nivel dialógico inicial, nos habla sobre el feedback a través de pruebas objetivas, de audio, de video o de screencast, un bloque 3 de microcursos, que nos habla sobre cómo retroalimentar en un nivel dialógico y nos orienta sobre unos microcursos sobre retroalimentar desde contenidos digitales enriquecidos, análisis de datos, alfabetizar al estudiante en la retroalimentación. Eh, un nivel C1 eh, que nos orienta sobre eh, cómo retroalimentar desde sistemas de condicionales. Allí hay dos microcursos sobre la configuración de condicionales y rutas de aprendizaje y sobre cómo ludificar una LMS para eh, eh, crear pues, estrategias de retroalimentación. Y un nivel C2, que sería como el, el más, el, el, el pionero, en el que veríamos cómo retroalimentar desde una mirada a la inteligencia artificial. Allí vamos a tener un microcurso muy introductorio a herramientas de inteligencia artificial para retroalimentar y uno de cierre sobre cómo investigar nuestra propia práctica de retroalimentación. Hasta ahí cerraría la, la estrategia, el mapa de nuestra estrategia. No sé, Paco, si aquí se requiere alguna traducción de, como de, de, de cierre de esta parte. Sí. Uh, I think it was quite clear in terms of uh, providing the map you have been using and the hierarchy, how you have created it through the DigiOp uh, Comp Edu uh, Framework. Uh, lo único es, es verdad que vamos un poco corto de tiempo. Ah, ok, voy más rápido. Listo, okay. listo, listo. <laughs> ok. Bueno, eh, eh, seguimos entonces con la evaluación del plan. Eh, esta evaluación se desarrolló a partir de eh, pues, todo el tema de evaluación de entrada. Entonces, bueno, el, se crea un instrumento para validar la propuesta temática de una validación por pares. Se aplica eh, a ocho expertos, entre profesores e investigadores, que validen esta propuesta temática. Nos hablan acerca de los resultados y nos dicen que el 80% de la estrategia está muy bien, pero pues que hay algunos elementos que se deben mejorar. Entonces mejoramos o realizamos ajustes en dos niveles específicos de la propuesta. Eh, luego pues ya pasamos a la fase en la que nos encontramos en este momento, que es la fase de diseño. Y allí estamos avanzando en la construcción del prototipo de la estrategia. 
eh, para crear este prototipo. Entonces, estamos nosotros avanzando en este momento en la creación de unos guiono, guiones, que son los scripts, los contenidos de los microcursos. Eh, estos contenidos van a, eh, están en, en fase de evaluación por expertos y también de revisión por la dirección de la tesis. Eh, después pasaremos a una fase de producción donde seleccionaremos las herramientas para su desarrollo y finalmente aplicaremos un test para confirmar que toda nuestra estrategia esté aplicando los principios de la teoría cognitiva al aprendizaje multimedia. Eh, aquí podemos ver un ejemplo del de script, lo, de, la, de los guiones que estamos diseñando para cada microcurso. Eh, cada uno tiene una secuencia lógica entre una contextualización, una explicación, una gentrificación, unos ejercicios de refuerzo y una identificación del nivel de transferencia que hace el profesor de esos contenidos. Eh, también estamos esperando una validación por expertos de este contenido para no pasar una fase de producción sin este aval. Luego eh, estamos, iniciaremos la fase de producción, allí estamos comparando unas plataformas de microlearning que la revisión sistemática también nos ofreció y estamos comparando particularmente el uso de Ed App y el uso de Talent Cards que son herramientas eh, diseñadas específicamente para diseñar microaprendizaje. Estamos comparando un par de herramientas sobre inteligencia artificial para la producción de los videos como Simple How y Numen 5 y bueno, esto cerrará con una producción en línea. Y finalmente el prototipo pues va a requerir la validación eh, de que estemos aplicando realmente los principios de la teoría cognitiva del aprendizaje multimedia y para eso también tenemos un instrumento basado en Tufan eh, quien ha avanzado un poco en el estudio de cómo eh, diseñar micro contenidos que respeten estos principios. Eh, ya pues para, para terminar podemos ver que hemos superado un poco las fases de análisis, de desarrollo, nos encontramos en la fase de diseño y estamos a la expectativa pues para pasar a, la, a las fases finales de implementación y evaluación. Eh, aquí les señalo las dos referencias, los dos, las dos revisiones sistemáticas que se han publicado como producto de la investigación. Y bueno, por ahora creo que no es más para comentar. Ok, muchas gracias. Ya, yeah, thank you.